Survivor specialists John and McKenna are back to rewind this episode, this crazy, insane, wild episode of Survivor 46. Let's get into it. McKenna, to get into this episode, it's so tough because there's so much happens in this episode. And a lot of it, there's new stuff that we see. Uh, We have the hide and seek segment, which I don't, I can't think of any straight comparables to it in Survivor history. Mm. But something like this has to have happened before, right? Well, like, I feel like they play games like Mafia and things to, well, right. Um, some people don't know, but like Q is using that the same as some people might use something like Mafia to understand social thing. I don't know. It, like this it's a is stretch. Q's logic through <laughs> this, and and Venus as well, because Venus also has confessionals during this segment saying, you know, what this means about people and how they're responding to things. It's all a stretch because <laughs> let's be real. It's hide-and-seek. Yeah, sure, you might be able to figure out how competitive someone is by where they're hiding. But this isn't like, oh, I can tell exactly how you lie when we play something like Mafia. Like, <laughs> it's it's so wild that this is happening. I mm-hmm. imagine survivors do stuff like this all the time. I, I, I hope this actually starts a discussion in the survivor community about what type of things they do do to pass the time while playing. Because obviously there's a lot of downtime in mm-hmm. Survivor. So it'd be interesting to see how other casts have done this. But this is kind of the first segment in Survivor history that's like this. And despite it being arguably one of the most entertaining segments of television we have had in years. Yeah. I, I, like, I don't we, know. we don't have anything to compare it to. So this is our only chance to really talk about it on this podcast. I mean, Q would be me. Like, I'd be like, let's play hide and seek, but just because I'm bored and really want um, to to play a game. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Alrighty, let's get into our outwit, outplay it, outlast moments. Outwit, we are talking about alliance implosions. So this plus one alliance that was formed with the journey, they keep voting each other out. And it's... It, it, it's just not working. It, it's a really interesting aspect of this season because the question now becomes, was this ever really an alliance? Or were these people just agreeing to something that was convenient, gave them the majority in a tribe, and they kind of have it to fall back on? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Like, McKenna, what do you think? Was there any? Was there ever a point in this game where this six could actually be a six? It's hard when you're on separate beaches like they are and just trying to be like, all right, now we have to form all of our games together. Meanwhile, you know, like Maria's got Charlie. Now Charlie is roped in on it, but like he wasn't originally in the plus one. You know, Charlie has been and like all of these intermingling of relationships and alliances are different from the what the plus one would want the plus one is just let's get everyone else out then deal with us yeah it's so interesting but i think that's really what leads into the group that i want to talk about in this and it's it's a little different because the example i'm bringing is uh an original tribe that was said they were going to stick together but they were preaching this idea of being an alliance and that's comma for magic extinction i Mm -hmm. i think and specifically at this point, I want to talk about the Eric boot because this is the point where it really becomes clear this tribe can't work together. And it's very similar to what we see with Nami, with Nami just turning on each other throughout 46 at this point, but also just dissecting how Kama was this like very tight group. They go into the merge with huge numbers over Lesu, and they decide, okay, let's blindside Joe get him out of here because he's a massive challenge tight and that's kind of what you have to do when Joe Englund's on a season. You have to mm-hmm. get rid of him the first chance he you get that he doesn't have individual immunity. Not in my opinion, but... That's fair. Uh, I mean, arguably, but that tends to be the opinion that everyone has on seasons mm-hmm. where Joe Englund is involved. Yes. Uh, 
And then, logically, based on everything we have seen in the pre-merge of that season, plus that merge episode, Kama should be, um, what, seven well strong at off. this point? Yeah, well yeah. set to, like, destroy the merge. Yeah, they should be. But immediately, like, this is the first time that they, they actually have to work together on a vote, and it doesn't work. And instead, we have Gavin, who wants to make a big move, much like Tevin did last week when he wanted to take out Soda. And he goes after Eric. Like, mm -hmm. Eric Haveman is just left out to dry here by His these quote, commas. number one ally. And, and, and that, it reflects so much to what we're seeing in 46 right now. Because as we go deeper into 46, and, and yes, there's this alliance. And again, it's questionable if it was ever going to work together. But we have now gone two straight votes. And, and I mean, granted, you, you technically there's the soda vote in the middle, but it was split drives, whatever. It doesn't really count. Mm -hmm. This alliance has voted someone out of it for two straight votes now. With Tim yep. and with... Tech. Well, Tim, if you're not counting Soda, you can't count Tim. Tim was doing no, no, no. You have to count Tim because he's part of the alliance, and there were more people <laughs> of, from the alliance on that side of the swap last year too. True, true, true. So, so I, I it, 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 yes, there's an asterisk there, but this alliance is imploding on itself, and just like in EOE, I mean, hopefully, like it is in EOE, when we see the fallout of that, the following episode after Eric is voted out. John, it's, is that the one with the live tribal council that we're watching over on the Patreon? Yeah, it is. Uh, you should definitely take a look because let me so, take one episode of Survivor. Become a patron uh, so you can listen to this episode. We are talking EOE episode 8, Y'all Making Me Crazy. It will be up on the Patreon. The link is right on the screen right here. So please become a patron so you can listen to us talk more Survivor or more movies or amazing more amazing race like there's a lot going on over on the patreon and also don't forget to like subscribe do all the things that you should be doing on youtube as well john continue your thought uh so the, like the big thing is that there's so much follow and i really hope 46 kind of follows that with what we have here because what we see in edge of extinction as a result of eric being voted out is there's so much paranoia no one knows who they can trust anymore and i feel like we're getting to that point with 46 as well now and i mean we'll talk about it a little bit more when we're talking about live tribals and everything but just the information that was coming out in this live tribal in this week's episode of 46 can have a lot of repercussions there can be and as much as things seem to be in a spot where yes there was this large group yes there are these like smaller groups of tribes but it doesn't feel like any of them feel comfortable with the remaining members of their tribe. Obviously, Nami all hates Venus. Um, Kenzie and Tiffany are now super skeptical of Q. And based on the secret scene we saw, Maria doesn't trust Ben. So I, I'm hoping this will kind of follow suit with Air, I, um, Edge of Extinction here. But that... Eric Haifman boot just goes to show that these large alliances feel like they just have the numbers and they can be, they're impenetrable, but there are so many cracks when they actually get to the point where they are voting. And I think that's why we almost struggled a little bit finding examples of this because we don't think of them as large alliances imploding on themselves. Instead, we think of them as, yeah, these people finally had a chance to vote each other out. <laughs> yeah exactly so the one that i am choosing is heroes healers hustlers um basically ben implodes everything he implodes all of his alliances he has like his group that um with like lauren dr mike where they think he's being the double agent to chrissy ryan and so then you know, Chrissy and Ryan think Ben is with him. And then JP gets blindsided. Ben does a Ben bomb. And, you know, all everything just kind of implodes in the, like, two or three boots with JP. What's really interesting about this Ben example is Ben becomes a pariah in it. 
right? Where he he becomes the pariah of the season, where everyone's just like blaming them for everything that happens because he's double crossing people, he's he's working both sides. Do you think Q might end up in as this like pariah in 46 now because of what he pulled at Tribal Council? Either that or they'll keep using him, but the way he talks and speaks is like very mob bossy. So mm-hmm. they might be like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Let like go l- let's let him go. Yeah, it, it's very interesting, and I'm not a hundred percent sure how it'll go but what we saw in hhh as a result of this is uh, first off jp goes Mm -hmm. and and the most interesting thing about tevin going in this position as opposed to jp or eric haifman like tevin felt like he's a character well yes he was a character (laughs) but he also felt like really central to everything that was going on in the season arguably eric eric was kind of central um he was kind of that figurehead for the commas but i think more people associate that with Ron Clark and it transitions into Gavin through mm-hmm. that blind side. Whereas JP was kind of just there on HHH. Mm-hmm. So so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out because it leads to a bigger imbalance of power. Mm-hmm. But is these alliances just falling apart? That's the most yeah. interesting thing about this because there is something. And, and granted, these are newer examples, right? These are all examples within the last 10 years at this point. This, I guess it's even more recent than the 10 years. It's the most, it's the last like 10 seasons. But it, it, this is something that I think the further we get into Survivor and the more we have people who are fans of the game playing Survivor, the more we see people understanding these ideals of like, oh, I have to build an alliance, mm-hmm. but also being willing to be like, whatever, I'm going to say yes to every alliance and I'm just going to turn on it whenever I get a chance. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, like, maybe had Ben chosen a side, you know, mm-hmm. we wouldn't see the implosion here. Had, you know, comma stuck to their words and, like, all right, we're going comma to the seven, things could have been different. <laughs> but, um, I, you it's know, the, the it, weirdest... it makes for better TV in the end that when an alliance kind of implodes the way that it does. The weirder thing about comma imploding is that there are such huge threats outside of comma in EO. Mm-hmm. And, and while the implosion in HHH can really be credited to Ben, who ultimately is a massive threat in that game. It's it doesn't feel the same because it doesn't feel like people are neglecting the fact that they are big threats. Yes, okay, JP goes here. We don't know exactly what was going on in the island. Maybe JP was a big threat on the island, but from the edit, it didn't feel that way. Right. But this is it's these implosions just lead to so much chaos afterwards. And that's where 46 is headed. It doesn't matter who's the best players and like arguably like the players on 46 might not be the best survivor players of all time there are some very skilled survivor players on this season but i think we're seeing a lot of messy survivor play Mm -hmm. and because of that it's we're going to be looking at this episode and and this implosion of this supposed six as probably a pivotal turning point in this season moving forward yeah exactly um so let's move on to our outplay moment and we are going to talk about the challenge this time we have uh danced around at these last few episodes we haven't talked specific challenges but we are talking this one we are talking get a grip it is a classic survivor challenge and i was like we can't not talk about it i know we've talked about talked about instances before in uh some of our previous podcasts but I want to, you know, deep dive two of them and also talk about this, where this challenge is where Jeff gives us the rice negotiation. Mm -hmm. But for me, watching it as a super fan, this is one of the most iconic challenges in Survivor history. I don't care if I'm out first. I want to say I played that. I did that. So... For the rice negotiation to happen on, like, 
a really, you know, iconic Survivor challenge, I think, in my mind, would almost also lead me to what happened in 46, where people don't want to give up their sh- their shot at immunity because they either, you know, need to win or want to play in this challenge, feel like they can do well, seen it on their TV, seen Ozzy, Parvati, you know, these people win or do well in the challenge and, and want to try it, their hand at it. I agree to an extent. Uh, obviously, this is an iconic Survivor challenge. And ha- again, leading more towards casting fans of the show, it does make more sense that they would want to compete in the challenge. That being said, this challenge is quite difficult. Mm-hmm. It requires a lot of upper body strength, especially now that we see those footholds getting smaller and smaller in this challenge. And there's a reason why the record that Ozzy set was over two hours long. Mm-hmm. And these challenges only last just over 20 minutes now. It's because it's not really the same challenge in, in all senses of the words. Yes, the premise of it's the same, but it's not the exact same circumstances. Right. And But because of that and the difficulty of the challenge, this does seem like the perfect challenge to have a rice negotiation at. Because I think you want the rice negotiation. I think production wants the rice negotiation to happen. And I think they want people to sit out of challenges for it. Mm -hmm. So choosing this challenge where you're either good at this challenge or you're not good at this challenge. This isn't one of those challenges where you're like, ah, maybe I can pull it off. Yeah. Right. And we see that with like Q and Liz agreeing to step out, Charlie agreeing to sit out. Uh, They just can't get the fourth, which is great because we have gone, we've had these rice negotiations for the last six seasons. And this is the first time it's been denied, which is fantastic. Uh, But This challenge is one you really need to ask yourself, what's going to benefit me more in this game? And Mm -hmm. that's what I think these rice negotiations should be, as opposed to, okay, well, we're just giving you food now. Yeah, I mean, I think what they really lacked, though, is the fear tactic of the Mm -hmm. knife and the stabbing of the bat. That is true. That is true. I honestly was like, Jeff, there's no knife this time. I'm severely disappointed. (laughs) <laughs> because the, the dramatics of that was so intense. But maybe Jeff also realized, you know what, this is a one-time thing. Everyone's going to, like, love it, and then we're never mm-hmm. going to do it again. Wouldn't no! <laughs> Bring back the knife! Um, yeah, so, like, for me, I would definitely want to compete. I don't think I would win it, but I you never know until you try it. So, like, mm-hmm. I feel like I could do well because I'm decent at, like, grin and bearing it yeah. and like struggle through the pain and like it's mind over matter and I'm so competitive that I'm going to try my damnedest to win or I will fall off like Michelle and Andrea I, I think that this challenge is just a little different than say and I'm just saying this because it's an endurance challenge that I watched an episode of Survivor for recently the the ball on the bow challenge right where anyone can really win that challenge. The, the challenge that's in the Patreon episode that yeah, we exactly. won? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That, that's why I, it's fresh in my mind. Uh, mm-hmm. But because of that, like that type of endurance challenge feels like a bad challenge to do the rice negotiation at because everyone feels that they can win that because everyone can win that. When you get this one, ultimately, who do we see winning this challenge most of the time? Venus. Right, Venus is kind of the person you expect to win this. Like we just looked through the quick history. Venus of the and Kevin, yeah, are are probably the. Yeah, exactly. It's the. Um, I mean, we look at like Aussie and Cook Islands when he wins it. Obviously, um, Tyson. We have Tyson. We have um, Barbie and Danielle, of course, in Heroes versus Villains, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, even like D last season winning it. Right, like there's a very oh, he has toes. All right. Well, that's fair. Um, <laughs> but typically, someone like Hunter isn't the prototypical type of person you see here. And I think a lot of people equate Hunter as the big macho guy and don't realize how lean he is. Mm-hmm. He's got um, he's got thighs for days gripping that ball. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is impressive, uh, beyond and- impressive. Someone else who we don't think would have won this challenge, Twyla. 
The yeah. first time we see this challenge is in Vanuatu, and Twyla wins the challenge. And mm. she's not, she doesn't fall under that, you know, body type that would win this challenge. But the challenge is slightly different as it is nowadays to the middle seasons. It had rope rungs mm-hmm. instead of indents. So it was like you could kind of slip off of it in, in easier maybe, but it also maybe gave you a bigger like lip to hold on to. Um, this, this iteration of it is so like, so, so different. Right. Mm -hmm. Because if you like grip your thighs onto the pole, you kind of have a little seat with the rope. Um, You don't just slip down. Um, So, John, what are your thoughts on Twyla winning and like the very first time we see this challenge? Well, first off, Twyla Tanner not does not get enough respect in the survivor community. Uh, So first off, she gets in here at the specialist. She sure does. We love Vanuatu. Um, But like you said, it's almost a different challenge. And it's kind of like how we were comparing it with like the notches being smaller now. With a rope, there's so many more elements to this challenge than just mm-hmm. hold on for dear life. Because again, you have those hand grips, you kind of have those stopping points where like you slide down and like you, you feel grip that thing. Yeah, you grip that thing tight enough with your uh with your legs, you're 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 clutch, you're sitting there and you're just like resting on this rope. Mm-hmm. Um but I don't know. This I think this version of the challenge feels more like what you were saying. If the grin and bear it, go out for it, uh, and like just go as long as possible aspect of it. Whereas mm-hmm. the challenge has evolved to a point where it's more difficult to do that. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I agree. I agree. Um... I feel like what also people underestimate is the ability to feel where those divots are. And you see, you know, people scrounging to try and get back up where here you can kind of nicely rest and, oh, Mm -hmm. there's the edge of the rope and I'm good. Or you, it'll help you grip to get back up the pole a little bit more. So it definitely has changed a lot since the the first one. But John, you mentioned heroes versus villains. I did. So why don't we get into it for your outplay moment? Yeah. So when I'm thinking of it, I think when we think of get a grip, the heroes versus villain is probably the most iconic version of it, right? Mm-hmm. Where you have Parvati just hanging off of the pole on like with one just- hand one leg and just chill in there and yeah. that kind of reminded me of what um hunter does at the end of this challenge where he's just like showboating yeah a bit uh, obviously it's mid challenge when parv does it so makes a little more sense there mm-hmm. but there are other elements of this heroes versus villain iteration of the challenge that are kind like loosely connected to what's happening in 46 uh primarily a little bit (laughs) sorry yeah i just went a little bit a little bit uh because the end of that challenge in heroes versus villains we have danielle and parvati agreeing as to who's going to win and ultimately danielle gives the argument part of you you have the idol like let me let me have this one Mm -hmm. uh and again like squint really hard And as Charlie is just about to lose this challenge, he's trying to get those rice negotiations going with Jeff again. And Mm -hmm. just the the ability to talk at that point of the challenge and, like, try to agree to something is, it's kind of funny. Especially because it just really went to show how in power Danielle and Parvati were at that point and how secure they felt that they wouldn't be targeted. Yeah. And then also we have, you know, Venus, who's like, I'm going to win this, I'm going to win this, and then all of a sudden drops down, like Candace, mm-hmm. who Candace was just, like, chilling, and all of a sudden she's just like, meh, I don't think I'm going to out- outlast them, I'm done. Not that Venus, like, did that, I think she really was struggling, but it was yeah. just all of a sudden Venus is now out, and, like, I thought she was my odds-on favorite to win. Yeah, and we even had Tevin saying that he was going for Ozzy's record and still kind of, like, can't do it either, right? It, it, right? It's interesting because, like, 
that one was more set up than Venus just like dropping out. Venus not even getting to the final three of this was kind of shocking to me. Uh, like yeah. you said, odds on favorite to win just based on historical evidence of this challenge. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was kind of the same perception of Candace in this position where, yeah. especially because she was the she only played girl it before. left. Well, that too. Um, she played before, had gone for a very long time. And she was the only hero left, and it was the merge. So it was really important for a hero to win that. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of where Candace's heel turn happens in that season. Yeah, exactly. Anything else for Get a Grip, John? This is a fun challenge every once in a while. I, mm -hmm. I understand why we've gone to this point where it doesn't last for two hours anymore. But if that's the case, like... Jeff probably needs to stop comparing these challenges to previous challenges when they're not exactly the same. Because <laughs> I, well, it's I just also, like that record's not fair at this point, right? The the record of yeah. Ozzy held on for two hour, I think it's like two hours and fifteen minutes or something like that, or at least that's the timestamp we have on it. Right, right, right. It's not fair to compare this iteration of the challenge to that unless we see Ozzy do it again. Like, like, sure, have get Ozzy to do this just for fun and we'll we'll see if he can still do it for two hours okay we can keep the record but if it's a different iteration like we have to like put these asterisks beside these records right now unfortunately mm -hmm. yeah exactly all righty so here's the moment of the episode the cover we have tevin we have julia carter we have malcolm outlast live tribals um and neither of them outlasted live tribals but we are here nonetheless um this was an, an insane 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 tribal council because what happened i still couldn't tell you i feel like i can tell you about what happened in my moment and your moment but what this all was for in 40 in 46 no clue. That's the interesting thing about this 46 live tribal. And why tribals have kind of become a malign thing in the survivor community because once they started happening, they started happening a little too frequently. And we haven't, I would say, we haven't had a live tribal council like this one since Winners of War. Mm. I, I would say in the new era, like, yes, we've had like kind of live tribals, but they haven't been to this extent where. Right. No one really knows what's going on. They are gaining new information in the moment and, and adjusting the plans as is. Now, we do see in 46 that they do just go Tevin in the long run. And whatever Q was doing was probably for naught. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that first confessional of this next episode where Q explains what his thought process was um because i'm sure we know he, will... he did he had a perfect plan for this absolutely i mean there's got to be some reason behind it, especially because uh jeff probe said this was a this um q saying he wanted to quit here felt different than hannah and um Sean it felt like season. it was a play because he said the same thing earlier in the season so uh kenzie didn't play her shot in the dark if they had to go as a three yeah, and and we also saw last episode that um, Kenzie and Tiffany were joking about the fact that he was saying, oh, or they were saying, oh, he's probably going to come and tell us to vote him out uh, when mm -hmm. he's like flip flopping around who to vote. So clearly, this is something that's been going on a lot on this Yanu tribe. Yeah, but I I just I still don't understand where it got to it, it feels like time just ran out on everyone and no one really solidified the plan mm -hmm. and that's why we get to this moment where q's like okay i'm going to say this and rather than all being like okay that's easy let's just do that everyone's like no 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 q you're part of our plans we're <laughs> keeping you we are going to figure out amongst us what's going on and it's very similar to i would say now based on definitions of live tribals like, we can getting up here. and talking and well and, and that's the thing is like uh, most people i think at this point will will define a live tribal as a tribal council where people stand up 
they start talking and whispering to other people all over the place. Um, for several seasons, Survivor didn't give us subtitles for this whisper, so we had no idea what was going on. Uh, but, like, arguably, there were live tribal councils where, like, the vote kind of had to change based on conversations that were happening at tribal mm -hmm. council prior to this. But the first real live tribal council is that one in Game Changers where oh, tiny one in game changers tiny one in game changers which is a very exciting tribal council and we, this is the weird vote in game changers where mm -hmm. both tribes are going to tribal council but they're only voting one person out and JT gets up goes and talks to Culpepper and says because he believes he can flush their idol at the same time as like idling out Sandra and getting his target out, but he goes to Culpepper and says, yeah, they're voting out Sierra. Like, they're all voting Sierra, and then chaos ensues. Yeah, yeah. It... JT gets Malcolm voted out here, mm -hmm. and, and basically everyone lets JT know that, and he is labeled a turncoat, like, all anything you can think of and then he just leaves right after malcolm because he's trying to preserve all of his relationships with everyone new tribe mates old tribe mates and trying to just like let an easy person go out instead everything blows up because of one chaotic sentence and malcolm leaves it's very interesting as we get into this tribal council because you see moments where Sierra is trying to appeal to Haley about, hey, they're voting for me. Will you vote with me? Mm -hmm. and, and these type of things where they're leveraging their pre-existing relationships. Um, so it, it's so wild because it, it, it's a really weird tribal. It makes sense that this is our first live tribal council because of the format of this tribal uh, because yeah. the, the important thing to remember is, yes, both tribes were going to tribal council. They weren't able to talk to each other prior to tribal council. It's almost like Survivor orchestrated this type of moment. Mm -hmm. I don't think they expected it to get like this, because for a long time, and remember, maybe they did, because for a long time, Survivor did have rules that you weren't allowed to leave your seat at tribal council. So maybe they did, at this point, uh, agree that okay you know what people can get up and it's not part of the rules anymore so maybe production did kind of like orchestrate this a little bit more but mm -hmm. it's it's wild because it kind of changed how survivor was played for the next six seasons where these became so free there were three live tribals in winners at war i hate live tribals <laughs> i hate live tribals when we see them all the time seeing this live tribal in 46 was such a breath of fresh air because there was so much chaos going on. The editing was done in a great way to set everything up beforehand so that mm. we weren't a hundred percent sure where the vote was going. Obviously Q being like, vote me out was a totally out of left field. Never saw that one coming, but also we have subtitles. So we know the conversations that are happening at live tribals. Now mm -hmm. it, it just made it so that there was so much intrigue and, I never felt that there was a single point in this live tribal council in 46 where I knew what outcome was going to happen. Yes, <laughs> um, I agree. Then you have, you know, Tiffany getting let in on that her, her name was out there. And I feel like the madness of the scramble almost equates more to edge of extinction the episode we're watching over on the patreon where we deep dive it a lot more so please mm -hmm. go to uh, the patreon become a patron do all the things we love you um where you know the the vote scramble like it's everything everybody's ping-ponging back and forth here where you know in game changers jt is kind of the one to initiate and go over to brad mm -hmm. all of a sudden in EOE, everyone gets up, everyone's moving, shaking, going all around. And that's kind of what we see here in 46, where everybody's breaking off into small groups and scattering and trying to come back and get a consensus vote. 
Now, Edge of Extinction is prefaced with the fact that this is the vote right after the Eric Haifman vote. So Julie and Ron are feeling really on the outs because they weren't let in on that vote. Uh, mm -hmm. it's seeming, it seems that like this comma group that should exist doesn't exist. Uh, Devons and David spend so much time working on Ron and Julie for this vote so that they feel comfortable working with them. And I think the most fascinating thing about this tribal council in Edge of Extinction, why it's phenomenal. And I mean, I say it over on the Patreon, but Edge of Extinction is quite an underrated season at this point. Mm -hmm. um, ignore like the bad twist in the season and just accept it as part of the season. And like, it's, it's quite enjoyable because of moments like this. There is so much buildup in this tribal council to, you know, I mean, obviously, like, you know, if you realize what time you, it is while you're watching it, but you know, something's going to happen because it starts with everyone just answering Jeff. And then it starts with like, you know, people looking at each other and like giving each other nods and chuckling. And then it gets to the whispers as like other conversations are happening. And then Wentworth stands up. And yep. that's when all hell breaks loose. And I think it's also forming. Rick is stirring the pot and, and just bringing it and it's just boiling everything and masterclassing this tribal council into, you know, spilling over the cauldron. He's using his uh, little dash of the witch's coven in Wentworth um, and then just like stirring the pot, stirring the pot, stirring the pot until it boils over and everybody starts scrambling and talking. And then it turns out to be neither of the two names that are on the chopping block. And it becomes Julia who kind of throws herself under the bus with Rick's like twisting of words. It's really interesting. And I know Phil has mentioned on the recap and also digging deeper this week, you know, it's kind of a bit uneventful this tribal council because Julia Carter is the person who goes home, isn't a major mm -hmm. player. Uh, and that's kind of where 46 deviates from it with like Tevin was a big player, was someone we were expecting to go really far into the game. Um, the big thing though, the biggest takeaway that I have, and, and I think you had to watching this episode again, McKenna, mm -hmm. uh, with this tribal council is Rick's orchestration of it all. And just yes, how Rick manipulates everything that's said in that conversation or in that tribal council to make things go a certain way. And I think Q thinks that's exactly what he was doing in this instance. I know tribal councils can be boring. I mean, live tribals aren't really all that boring, but I know tribal councils can get, it can be boring, but I just feel like if you normally don't rewatch episodes or watch the episodes for the Patreon, watch this tribal council. Episode 8 of Edge of Extinction, because it is just beautiful. If you want to go on Survivor, watch this Tribal Council, mm -hmm. because the way that he twists words and, and leads conversations, it, it, it's just a masterclass in how Tribal Council should happen if you're on the bottom or anything like that. So, like, I definitely... Highly, highly recommend at least, if not watching the whole episode and then going over the Patreon, watch um, the, this Tribal Council. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's huge because this is it's one of those things where Rick Devins is remembered as a character and not so mm -hmm. much as like what he brought to the game. This goes to show you his social game and his strategic game here. Yeah. He set it up throughout the entire episode of working with Ron and Julie. Gets it to a point, and like, does he get lucky in this uh, tribal council? Absolutely. Julia mentions that she was like agree or confirming that the plan was a go with Wentworth, which he's like, oh, they're working together. That's weird. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Aurora says, uh, makes a comment about how Lesu should like could work together if they could just overcome their differences. And that's where Devin's really runs with it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why his performance in the tribal council is so masterful and how it varies from Q because Q, it feels like Q is the type of person who wants to be driving every vote. It's mm -hmm. been very clear of that throughout the entire season at this point. And 
it felt like his way of gaining control of this vote was saying, everyone vote me out. Yeah. And again, we're really going to need to see how he responds to it in this next episode to see where his head's at. But uh, it's just not on the same level as Devin's in that EOE uh, tribal council. Correct. Well, those are our outwit, outplay, outlast moments of the week. I do want to take a moment here to plug Dynamic Character Productions, our merge episode of Survivor. We put out bi week, bi weekly. Is that the. Ha, mm, yeah, it's week. one of those things where it's two times a week or every two weeks. It's a weird word. Okay, well, two times a week we put out episodes. We have a, a group of castaways who played Survivor over Zoom, and we put out episodes. Um, the Survivor Specialist sponsored the merge episode, so we just want to say thank you um, and shout and shout us out. Um, so if you want to play Survivor from the comfort of your home, follow us on Instagram, dcp underscore org. You could win a free month's subscription to the specialist patreon if you play who knows all right john what do the specialists have going on in the world this upcoming week we have a lot going on this week like we do every week i mean obviously over on the patreon we have uh tyler starting up for every season matters so not very often you get to hear people discuss Thailand. so but it might be refreshing yeah it might be uh, so $20 patrons get access to Every Season Matters, of course. Uh, and McKenna and I talked about Edge of Extinction, Episode 8, Y'all Making Me Crazy, uh, over on the Patreon today. That's there for $10 and $20 patrons. And, of course, McKenna and Celestina are going to be there with uh, their amazing race coverage uh, mm -hmm. later this week. And when we get back on the main channel, obviously, Phil and Will deep dove this wild episode of 46 if you haven't listened to that go listen to that yesterday brandon donlin joined phil and blake for some digging deeper and they also dove into a lot of elements from this episode of 46 uh mckenna you and phil covered the mega leg on the amazing the race yesterday leg. yes it was a lot of it was a lot of fun um phil and i are having a great time talking about the amazing race and it's just a good time podcast so if you want to watch a good time show Watch The Amazing Race and catch up on our podcast. <laughs> then on Sunday, Phil and Will are going to be joined by Caleb for the predictions and power rankings. That should be a great episode. Uh, make sure you tune into that. Monday, Breaking Phil and in I... all the 45 people here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all of them. Uh, we, we love season 45. What can we say? Uh, Phil and I will be talking... Um, Jojo Rabbit and the Great Dictator on you haven't seen that this week, so check that out on Monday. Phil and Will will be talking Deal or No Deal Island on Tuesday, and that brings us back to the Survivor episode Wednesday. nine recap on Wednesday. And let's let's just say whatever happens, like it's going to be <laughs> worth watching. So yes, make sure you tune fun. in. It's going to be fun. Thank you, everyone, and we will see you next time. Goodbye.